Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Forum, uh, the podcast for the DLP. Today, we're going to be talking to Amna Riaz Ali, who is a partner at Legalese International Lawyers and Consultants. She's also been a consultant for the ICRC, is a formal, former law clerk for the Supreme Court of Pakistan, and an advocate of the High Court. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amna. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about cultural heritage. Uh, that's our theme for this month. Uh, and we have a number of articles on the website which go into cultural heritage, cultural property, including intangible cultural property and why, um, and the ways in which IHL protects it during an armed conflict. Um, so I kind of wanted to start off the discussion by talking to you very generally about what is cultural property and why is it necessary that we protect this in an armed conflict. So uh, cultural property, if we look at the preamble of the 1954 Hague Convention, it really captures the essence of uh, cultural property and calls it any cultural property, uh, any damage to any property that has an identity of people. And it defines peoples uh, as very, very uh, broadly, every ethnic community, every racial community. Any damage would mean it is a damage to humanity. Cultural property, if we look at the word uh, property, that would not really encapsulate the entire idea behind this protection because uh, we have the 1972 convention on, uh, which is the World Heritage Convention that refers to uh, cultural heritage as well. And if we uh, look at article one of the cultural, uh, the 1954 Hague Convention, that defines cultural property also as being those um, artifacts, monuments, uh, objects, manuscript, books of cultural that depict the cultural heritage of people. And that includes archives, that includes books, that includes um, even folklore. We, we have, that would be, as you mentioned, the intangible cultural property. And we also have a convention on the int- intangible cultural property that includes folklore. So we have like, um, uh, you know, stories handed down from generations to generations. Uh, our grandparents, our great grandparents, those kind of stories as well would be part of cultural heritage. And I, I mentioned the preamble of uh, the Hague Convention because it talks about a humanity, the cultural heritage of the humanity. That means the identification that people have in their region, in their community, in their society, that is reflective of the world heritage. It, it contributes towards the world heritage. So um, the definition itself of cultural uh, property and heritage in the UNESCO World Heritage Convention or the 1954 uh, Hague Convention itself, and it, it shows the um, the importance and significance that people um, attribute to cultural property. It is a uh, Distinct in the sense that when we look at different international standards, we look at a reference to buildings that have to be protected, uh, civilian objects that have to be protected. But here, um, UNESCO uh, took the mandate to broaden the essence of what culture depicts and identifies. And that would also be knowledge, um, skills. It talks about uh, craftsmanship, a certain type of craft that is unique to a certain community or and this becomes even more important when we talk about um indigenous populations um indigenous societies and communities they attract special and added protection because they already have um, illegal protection under the UN Convention for Indigenous Protection of Indigenous Population. And the added protection would be because of their unique um, knowledge-based skills, craftsmanship, the, the folklore, the dance, for example, in, in our country, in Pakistan itself, we have uh, different provinces have a different sort of um, festivals and uh, dances. And we see the 1972 Convention, uh, World Heritage Convention, as well as the 19 before they are so broad in scope that even festivals and dances would be uh, falling squarely uh, within the definition. Um, so the Hague Convention places an obligation to which Pakistan is a party. Um, it places an obligation on state parties to respect uh, and refrain from any directing any attacks that would have uh, d- damaged the cultural heritage or the cultural uh, property of universal significance. So there is at times um, 
not at times, the question does arise as to what kind of um, monuments, objects, artifacts would qualify as being of universal value that, that stated in um, 1972 World Heritage Convention that the um, cultural heritage or property should be of universal value from the point of view, for example, art, science, and history, or anthropological, archaeological viewpoint. So that is um, a, a point of contention as well uh, when the universal universal point of view has to be addressed because um, not every object, not every um, um, knowledge, skill uh, can be documented or protected as cultural property, especially uh, in times of armed conflict. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, I also feel like it's, uh, it's quite interesting to look at cultural property in that sense because I think my first introduction to it was watching all of these films based on World War II era kind of art restitution, but they'd lost like a very, very prized possession in, in the form of a painting and like they're trying to get it back. And especially because we know during second, the Second World War that the Germans especially, and, and actually all parties to the conflict, they um, there was such a heavy uh, bombardment of pillage of damage to destruction of a cultural property and the looting of cultural objects and monuments that we saw an entire then legal regime come about for the protection specifically of cultural heritage. So I kind of wanted you to talk to me a little bit more about the specific protections and the legal instruments. Uh, we've talked about 19, the 1972 convention and to just go back a bit further into the 1954 one, um, if you could give our listeners a little bit of a, a brief about those. So in, in the 1974 uh, convention, if I read the definition to it, um, Article 1 of that convention, it includes movable or immovable property of great importance to the cultural heritage of every people, such as architecture, art, history, religious and secular architectural sites, group of buildings as a whole, manuscripts, book, other artistic or historical archaeological interest items. So we see this is very, very broad. Uh, but linked to this is also... Um, Article 4 of the Hague Convention that also serves as a waiver to um, the protection given to cultural property. And that waiver is subject to uh, military necessity. Uh, that means there can be instances where um, the cultural property that is otherwise has, that has special protection can be made the object, not the object of the attack, but it can be targeted if it serves a uh, direct military advantage. So that um, they were in one sense, if, if we would call it, is also provided in the Hague Convention and that that realizes the realities of, of war. Um, and if we look at Article 10 of the 1954 Convention, that is very important because um, that also enables uh, forces to identify which building is um, uh, w enjoys special protection uh, by the this emblem that is described in Article 16 of the 1954 Hague Convention. The emblem uh, itself is important at times of armed conflict because that's when the armed forces have to act and uh, the parties to the current conflict have to act. And if they have that uh, distinctive emblem, it helps them identify that this is the uh, property that cannot be targeted, that we have to refrain from causing any damage. In fact, there's an obligation on high contracting parties to not just respect, but also safeguard. So there is a positive obligation in states to ensure that they take precautions before directing attacks, that they uh, safeguard the cultural property or heritage, not just in their own territory, but refrain from any action that would be Article 4 as well of the Hague Convention that would make um, the damage the uh, cultural property of another uh, state territory or expose it to danger. So the, the Hague Convention in that way is very, very broad. And as, so is the um, UNESCO World Heritage Convention that also um, the the incident that led to this, the international movement was the, the temples in Egypt um, where uh, Sudan, Sudan, basically it was the Abu Sembel um, temple and Sudan and Egypt had called for international support to uh, save it from when they we had had the construction of the dam from prevented from flooding and they had dismantled um, uh, dismantled these and then they they had they were reassembled and this entire the cost was about eighty million US dollars and it's interesting uh, that fifty about fifty percent of this was funded by um, states. 
uh, to support this. And and this uh, this movement that the uh, the um, the call of Egypt and Sudan also it was very instrumental and led to the movement in Pakistan for uh, the ruins and preservation of the ruins at Manjandaro in Pakistan. So. This was the historical impetus behind the UNESCO Convention as well. Uh, the UNESCO Convention itself also um, places an obligation on states that they have to uh, identify a cultural property and then preserve it. That would mean that um, in, in peace times, for example, um, states are under an obligation to identify which property, uh, which monument uh, is um, requires to be protected at times of armed conflict and that identification is important because then it would um, it would restrict the military operations away from buildings that are otherwise enjoying um, special protection. And uh, when we when we talk about um, military necessity, um, we we can we can look at the enhanced protection that's uh, given in second protocol of the 1954 Hague Convention. Um, I believe Pakistan is not yet a party to the second protocol, but that it provides um, enhanced protection. That means uh, where military necessity allows collateral damage, allows you, uh, the forces or parties to conflict attack a building that is otherwise civilian if it gives them direct military advantage. But those buildings which enjoy enhanced protection under the 1954 um, second, second protocol to the Hague Convention, that cannot be attacked under any circumstance. And this is a very interesting uh development because we have seen historically um, a, a concerted policy is uh, is behind of warfare is to attack the cultural uh, property of uh, to to eliminate the, um, the history behind it the identification of that community and uh, the example on point and this could be the uh, Buddhas of Bamiyan uh, in 2001 in Afghanistan um, that would uh, it would just be maybe also a move of political defiance but also also to eliminate the history attached to uh, the people and the territory in that case. Yeah, and it is, it is very interesting when we look at the um, how the blue ed, uh, the blue symbol, the blue diamond symbol kind of works as a double-edged sword in the way that it's like, okay, these, you know, buildings, objects are meant to be given enhanced protection. And then on the flip side, it's like, okay, if you're going to engage in an ideological driven war, which is, you know, the purpose of which is to culturally annihilate a peoples, these are also the buildings that you should then go and attack. And it's kind of worked in both ways, especially when we've seen it in the Balkan conflicts as well. Um, and 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 also it's, it's very interesting that the, the protections in the law are quite extensive. Um, so in terms of the safekeeping allocated and everything, and and we saw in the Gulf War in Iraq that, the, the convention didn't apply, but also that we saw massive looting of Iraqi museums. And when it was happening, I think Donald Rumsfeld said something like, you know, this isn't something that we're trying to do or trying not to do. It just happens. Looting just happens. And, you know, actually underneath the, under IHL, it's very, um, the protections are very widespread in terms of like ensuring respect. I mean, the U.S. was meant to step in and ensure that there was safekeeping of these products of these um, objects that they weren't looted. Um, and so kind of, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the military necessity waiver that you've already talked about. Um, and just the fact that under the, the 1999 second protocol, it was kind of, um, there was an attempt made to make it a little bit more circumscribed in a way, because I mean, there was so much criticism about the fact that it was so broad. And then you had the Balkan conflicts and then you had the 1999 second protocol where they said, okay, actually it can only um, be, I mean, you can only have that waiver so long as there's a functional aspect to it, which is that it has to provide a military function. Um, and can you talk to me a bit more about that? Does it actually serve as describe that in a way does it actually narrow the application of the waiver or are we again left with a, a provision which is still indeterminate still results in lack of protection or even understanding about which sites remain protected and which are targetable because I remember um, when I was reading about it I think it was in either Mali or in the Sudan that they had a conflict where a non-state armed group was using a fortress and that fortress is actually a cultural heritage site but they're also like oh, it provides us with a military advantage because 
I mean, you know, that that also historically is why you would build a fortress in that actual place. Um, so, yeah, can, can we talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, so, like you mentioned, the Iraq, the looting of the Iraq museum, uh, that's a very significant and a very recent example as well. Um, on, on this, it's, it, it highlights the practical importance of uh, preservation of cultural property. Uh, Colonel Matthew Bogdan of the U.S. Army stated that about this 2003 Iraqi invasion, that without the historical context, um, you can't know much about the history without the preservation of these uh, objects and artifacts. So the practical importance importance other than the ethical importance, because we see the leaders shake hands, the war ends, um, but the scars uh, remain. And those woundings that they make the, the, the road to peace and uh, even more difficult or sometimes times impossible. Uh, but the military, uh, the necessity that you talk about military advantage, that is also a principle of customary international law. And it's, it's important to see that it is it is also subject to the principle of proportionality. So even if uh, deliberate and intentional uh, usage of property um, by parties to the conflict to transform it into a, maybe an object of attack or to get uh, protection, um, that would still be subject to the principle of proportionality. And uh, usually when we talk about um, military necessity, it would broadly fall under two categories. Uh, that would be collateral damage. And the second one would be intentionally directing attacks. But we, when, when, you, when we talk about um, collateral damage, for example, uh, the U.S. Um, invasion in 2003, by one account, it would be considered as a collateral damage. But um, that would happen when that building, cultural, cultural significance, is within the use or location, or usually it happens when it is in close proximity to um, a an area that is of military significance that would give direct military advantage to the other party. And that was the example of the um, the Iraqi museum. Um, it, it was stated that it is actually close to the Republican uh, guard compound, which was obviously a clear military um, a target. Uh, but the looting that was associated to it, the pillage that uh, was um, associated with it, of course, that also violates international rules and norms. Um, so collateral damage would itself be subject to uh, proportionality, to whether precautions were taken, and the fact that location would be instrumental of uh, the, the property of the monument in question. And this is why I again refer to the emblem, like you mentioned, the blue um, emblem, that would be important to, it would help the parties of the conflict to identify that this building has a special protection and in case of enhanced protection. Um, but more significant for this purpose would be uh, intentionally directing attacks. We have examples where, uh, especially when we talk about armed non-state groups, um, the purpose behind, like you talked about the Balkan Wars, and if you look at the Albanian genocide, the ethnic cleansing in Albania, we saw that the Serbian forces were targeting systematically um, the monuments and property that was of significance to uh, the Albanian minority, the Albanian Muslims at that time. And that intentional targeting is also, um, it's, it's a crime now under the Rome statute, but that uh, intentional targeting cannot be justified by the uh, military invoking a military necessity as a defense because it is one of the four uh, most important principles of of uh, IHL, like principle of distinction, uh, unnecessary suffering, uh, proportionality, and then military necessity. So we have the, um, if you look at the LIBOR code or the ICTY has stated time and time again that military necessity would be subject to unavoidable um outcome or unavoidable consequence, that unavoidable, that it, it is the only way to achieve that military end. It cannot be one of the ways. So this places a very heavy burden on the parties of the conflict um, to ensure that their operations are such that the military advantage is direct. And it also, it is the only way that that advantage or that uh, could be done. So we, we do have um, the the ICT, for example, in the, um, the hostage case, um, against the Nazi officers, it was it was allowed that uh, the these measures are sanctioned to uh, save for the safety of your own forces, uh, but 
the consequence or the action has to be um, unavoidable. The damage has to be unavoidable. So military necessity, um, yes, it has potential for abuse and potential for misuse. But if uh, we, we look at the contours of that, um, it, it is subject to proportionality, is it subject to the location, use, and uh, uh, the fact that it is the only way to uh, gain military advantage. So um, it, it's it's not it. For example, we do we also have examples where states have taken um, action to avoid targeting buildings of cultural property. For example, in the first Gulf War, uh, the USA had made um, a targeted list of uh, properties, about two to 3,000 properties in the first Gulf War, which were uh, could not be damaged or attacked. Uh, but of course, this remains the exception rather than the rule um, to consciously uh, avoid attacking cultural property. And, and the problem becomes even more apparent when we talk about armed non-state groups. And that is one of the challenges to um, for to see compliance of armed uh, non-state groups, especially when it's a war on based on uh, ideology. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think um, when I look at the military necessity waiver, it's so interesting that you also bring up the hostages case in um, from Nuremberg, that, that it does at the same time feel like it's very hard to say what is and what isn't unavoidable, uh, but that the law tries to tries to strike that balance in the sense of if you are going to damage or destroy these sites, that damage or destruction is entirely irreparable on um, buildings and property that you're not really you're not going to be able to you know get back ever again. Um, and and it's quite interesting to talk about it in the context of the first Gulf War and how much the U.S. T tried to protect these cultural sites, and then look at it in terms of the 2003. Iraq War, uh, where they were using a Babylon archaeological site as a helipad, uh, as like a military base. And um, then you had all of these archaeologists come in and be like, you know, these sands are thousands of years old. They tell us so much about how people lived at the time. And that's all gone now because you use this place as a military base. Um, and it is so much more interesting also when we look at it in the context of non-state actors. And I kind of want to go into that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about accountability. I think my first kind of interaction with um, anything related to cultural heritage was reading um, Fatah Bamsuda, the prosecutor of the ICC's um, written proceedings in the Mali judgment. So where she talks about Timbuktu, where, she, uh, you know, Al Mahdi was the first person who was ever prosecuted at the ICC for the destruction of heritage in Mali in 2016. And it was so beautifully written. It was just such a beautifully written piece that I, I was I was literally so shocked that it was so nice to read about how important cultural heritage is, why these archaeological sites in Timbuktu, why the manuscripts that were destroyed were so important and why we should all feel like, you know, this is a crime again, like an international crime against peoples. Um, and it was such a landmark judgment at the time, but still we're not seeing many prosecutions for these crimes in domestic courts. I mean, we saw them in the ICTY, as you referred to. We saw a little bit in Nuremberg, and then you had the ICC um, have this landmark judgment in 2016. Um, but what will happen until we see that kind of complementarity and national level accountability in domestic courts? And I'm also thinking about it in the context of Pakistan, where you had... Um, the conflict in Swat and how much it affected the uh, people going to the Seydou Sharif shrine and you know that completely ended because of the armed um, conflict and that that's that's really um, a sign of intangible cultural heritage that the shrine is still there um, but you have a lack of people going because of the armed conflict um, so where do we stand on domestic accountability how can we promote this how can we enhance accountability and the complementarity of domestic systems. So uh, the judgment that you mentioned, um, Ahmed al, al, uh, Ahmed al Faki al Mahdi in 2016, I, I believe it was 27 September. Um, yes, that is a very, uh, landmark. It is a landmark judgment and, uh, more so because, uh, the only charge that was brought against, um, al Mahdi in that case was, uh, intentionally directing attacks for, um, against civilian objects. So, so we see it was, um, 
usually uh, when we see prosecution of this nature, especially in criminal courts, a number of charges are brought in case that uh, one charges prosecution fails to prove that. But here, um, the fact that the court found and convicted him of nine years imprisonment and uh, 2.7 million um, euros as the compensation, that's that's very, it is also an example for states to follow. Um, in, in this case, uh, it was possible because Mali had referred the situation itself and referred um, the case to uh, ICC. So we are aware of the limitations posed by the International Criminal Court. It is, of course, an international court. It is uh, subject to states' consent and jurisdiction and also um, the way that it applies. Uh, in that case, uh, domestic complementarity, as you say, is very significant and important. Uh, we do have certain cases, uh, sorry, legislations in place um, for attacking um, the civilian objects for um, our international humanitarian obligations in our domestic law, uh, but the implementation is uh, lacking. Its implementation, um, the kind of uh, the severity of the penal sanctions that are attributed to that are also um, lacking in its force that obviously impacts the overall um, effectiveness of any law that is in place. and uh, in, in the broad nature of the individual criminal responsibility, that kind of development in our own legal system would be very important or would be very uh, crucial towards ensuring that those who participated in any form, directly or indirectly, uh, would be prosecuted and the penal sanctions attracted would be severe uh, and not just uh, ordinary. Um, precisely because this promotes the tolerance, the harmony, the peace that we do refer to when we live in a global village. Um, if, if you look at Almandi's case, um, he was um, held responsible for all counts under individual criminal responsibility, 25, Article 25, 3, um, A, B, C, for co direct co-perpetration, for soliciting, inducing, for or any, any other way participating. And, and the ideology of war behind this was important because the court did not discuss um, the reason behind it. Uh, the court did not address what provoked and what ideology was behind this attack. The fact that it provided no military advantage um, uh, to the group that was linked to um, Al-Qaeda, uh, no, no military, military advantage was also um, important recognition by the court. Um, nine, ten religious sites were directly attacked. And um, it's, it's interesting to see that in that case, the compensation uh, was given and the victims were the people of Mali, um, the, the community and the population and um, the people who that this was the uh, source of income because of tourism as well. Um, so the court but there are also challenges which are which you can see within this judgment as well, because um, in this case, the court uh, refrained from squarely uh, tackling the fact that cultural property um, is a violation because it has um, a challenged or hurt or violated on the norms on the basis of universal humanity or heritage that is held uh, by people around the world. So that universal element uh, of a cultural property was um, uh, missing from the judgment of the court, um, but they they addressed it more in terms of the direct um, implications and the impact it had on the civilian population of Mali. So uh, he is so here we see that. Um, the universal point of view has to be clarified, and in some ways, perhaps the definition should be. Um, as I stated earlier, it is broad, uh, but perhaps it could squarely address those kind of monuments, sites, um, uh, archives, museums, and those buildings that are uh, very clear and it does, does not require that much of interpretation or uh, that um, a universal uh, force, basically, to protect it, because every single object of mere interest cannot be uh, protected. Um, for example, if you talk about um, the... Uh, uh, in Syria, the entire city of um, Palmyra was uh, leveled by ISIS, and that was a very, very important historical city. And uh, the temple there, uh, which was considered to be the most important building and significant in the entire Middle East. So 
when we talk about ISIS, a non-state actor, to be prosecuted before the ICC um, for the same intentionally directing attack, that would be a raise questions of uh, jurisdiction of the ICJ. Um, would 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 it be because of the state on the territory of which this happened, or would it be because of uh, you know UN Security Council referral, or how would ISIS be prosecuted for this act? So um, the questions of jurisdiction is. Um, uh, lends more support to the case for improving, enhancing domestic prosecutions. And that also protects the um, uh, principle of sovereignty, which is also encapsulated within the um, Hague Convention, that we, we have questions of sovereignty for states um, in pro prosecution for cultural property or the responsibility in states to protect cultural property. And that element is safeguarded uh, when states' own domestic laws are in conformity with these standards and uh, the penal sanctions are effective in their, um, in mitigating these instances and bringing those to account who have intentionally done so. Yeah, um, it's so interesting. I did not actually know that it was 2.7 million euros worth of costs um, in that judgment. That's really interesting. Um, and and to talk more about then the big issue now in the context of you know international law relating to cultural heritage and armed conflicts is that of non-state actors. And you've talked about ISIS, we've talked about Palmyra, and also um, and I kind of want to bring in two points here in in the sense of awareness. I was reading about this study where a lot of non-state actors were like, actually, we really do want to protect natural uh, cultural heritage sites. So there are especially I think in Sudan, the SPLM, and um, in Syria, you have the Rojava um, Antiquities Authority, which has said, we're actually going to ensure that during an armed conflict, cultural heritage is protected. And under UNESCO, UNESCO can provide technical assistance under the Hague Convention for states, but it doesn't provide the same for non-state actors. And so you, we've had non-state actors even in Mali, even in um, the, the Kurdish Rojava Antiquities Authority, reach out to UNESCO and receiving no reply um, to their letters about how do we go about protecting um, this cultural heritage, this cultural property, and about how that that's such a, I, I think for me, that's such a missed opportunity to engage with non-state actors and be like, no, actually, we're going to, we're going to help you, especially with the rise of NIACs being so much more prevalent now compared to IACs. And the second point I kind of want to touch on with regard to non-state actors is the whole idea of um, safe havens. Um, it was really interesting to me to know that in Afghanistan, uh, during the armed conflict, half of the Afghan Afghanistan Museum was shipped to Paris, some of it was shipped to um, Switzerland, and they were making this, these like, Afghan museums in exile. And um, when this was talked about, I think in the Security Council, the representative for Egypt was like, we have to be very, very careful that this is actually returned to the countries once armed conflict is over. Now that we're seeing very prolonged, very protracted armed conflicts, the idea is, if I'm going to go and see, you know, Afghanistan's cultural heritage, cultural history, am I going to go and see it in a Paris, in a museum in Paris or Switzerland, or will I ever be able to go and see it in in the actual territory? And and I think it is a huge issue, even when we're talking about, you know, post Second World War restitution, which is where I kind of got into the whole idea of cultural property and how this gets returned, and the fact that. Um, even even with the Buddha statues in Bamiyan, we we see that kind of elevated concern um, for cultural pro property and heritage, which are attacked on the basis of non-state actors for ideological reasons. And I kind of think maybe I'm being very very cynical in seeing this as a route for the West to reclaim our cultural property <laughs> in a way. Um, but, but those are the two things I, I find are quite problematic when we're looking at non-state actors, the lack of technical assistance, but also the new thing that, okay, if we can't protect, if these people are going to go ahead and attack it, how about we do these safe havens and send everything to Paris and Belgium and Switzerland? 
So that, that's very interesting. And that's uh, one of the practical uh, challenges that uh, we face. Um, we, we have a convention of 1970 convention against the illicit transport or trade of uh, uh, cultural property and artifacts and uh, the restitution for 2003 invasion, the restitution occurred for some of the artifacts to Iraq in 2000, not until uh, 2006. So first, yes, it is uh, dependent on the conscious uh, good faith of the states. And that's how international rule of law is up held, especially when you look at the shift to a more uh, communal oriented uh, standards of international law, as opposed to individualistic um, trends in the history. So the good faith, a duty of state would be at paramount to uphold these obligations and act in good faith. Um, but when we talk about non-state actors, uh, the, the issue of their compliance to IHL aside, uh, the Geneva Academy and IHL have noted a number of uh, ways in which they do engage, ICRC being one of the humanitarian organizations. Um, these organizations are opening important doors for dialogue, not just to um, de suppress the hostilities and to bring varying parties to the table, but also to raise this awareness amongst non-state actors. Because if um, the the, uh, the forces, the jure forces of the state, are banned by law, legitimate question to their end is they deliberately violate the law. So awareness mechanisms, for example, the Geneva Convention noted a three-prong uh, method that was uh, self-monitoring, self-reporting by the non-state, armed non-state actors, and then third-party monitoring of um, their violations and entering into dialogue about why and how they have um, violated these norms from which they too could benefit. And then the third would be uh, the on-field missions to um, collect information for record collection, because that's also an international obligation under these treaties, and also to engage with these armed non-state actors to realize the importance that they have. So the ethical importance with this, um, uh, as uh, one of the, um, uh, George Stout, he was a museum con a conservator who, who stated this after World War II, that the bombardments um, would, would end uh, but the the psyche, the impact on the psyche of the people would have everlasting consequences for negotiations. And these are one of the reasons that further enable armed non-state groups to retaliate. Um, and so the uh, principle of reciprocity um, is very it plays a very crucial and important role in this when non-state actors um, are the laws applied to them, especially in non in non international armed conflict, uh, either by basis of on basis of customary international law, or the majority of uh, view would be the principle of legislative uh, jurisdiction by virtue of them being active on the territory of a contracting party, they would be bound. So once they are bound, not just do they owe obligations, but for them to realize that they are also entitled to certain. Um, safeguards, which would only come in due course once they uphold these um, ideas. And that too, when we talk about the ideological war, um, the it's stemming from religious um, questions. And that's why this Al-Mahdi judgment is important because this was not a point of discussion. It was no defense that um, you, you felt that it, this is uh, un-Islamic. Um, that was the uh, root argument uh, there. And, and the fact that when we talk about tolerance and uh, um, non-state actors increasingly trying to seek international recognition. I think that kind of pressure on them would also help root the way for recognizing their duty to uh, safeguard cultural property. So recognition and their own political motivations would be one, but raising awareness, uh, the work of ICRC and other um, humanitarian organizations is very important. And that's where self-reporting and third-party reporting helps build those records and those are then disseminated. Yeah, that's a really great point, actually. I hadn't thought about it in that, in that context. Uh, that's really, really interesting. Um, thank you so much, Amna. I know that you have to leave and we've already taken up a lot of your time. Uh, this is such an interesting discussion and we really hope that we'll have you on future episodes yeah. of the forum. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. And I too learned certain interesting examples from you. So uh, the, the ones that you talk about uh, shifting to Paris and in uh, the Afghanistan. So I'm going to look at that. It seems very interesting. And thank you for having me. And I hope to be here one more time. I'd like to thank RSIL uh, as well as the support by ICRC for this. Thank, thank you very so much. much.